Welcome to another episode of Up To. Ten years ago, Up To started as a live event series showcasing leaders who are as humble as they are successful. The humility piece is extremely important as we identify leaders who can inspire others. We try to focus our interviews on the non-business aspects of their lives. And in doing so, we have found there's a real thirst to explore their hearts and minds in atypical ways. Our host, as always, is Adam Kaufman. And on this episode, we are joined by Jim Jamison. If you're a business owner, an executive, or a rising member of a management team, I don't have to tell you about the importance of having team members and partners you can trust. A firm that I've worked with for years and have trusted myself to refer my colleagues to is Vividfront, an award-winning digital marketing, branding, and website development firm based in Cleveland, Ohio, but with clients all over America. Vividfront's focus is on scaling brands digitally. They create holistic, return-on-investment-centric strategies and solutions for middle market companies who want to grow. They do paid advertising, influencer and social media marketing, e-commerce strategies, lead generation websites, I could go on. Their expertise is expansive and their tactful leadership team, all of whom I know, has the entrepreneurial experience to turn ideas into revenue producing business plans. Yes, I am reading a script, but I will tell you that I sought Vividfront out for this podcast because I already believed in them seeing what they did in the marketplace. So if you're seeking a partner to take your business to the next level, or if you're looking for an opportunity to work for a top agency with an amazing culture, truly an amazing culture, check out their website at vividfront.com or send me a note and I'll introduce you to my friends who run the company there. Vividfront, great organization. Our guest today is a true global citizen who continues to travel the world in search of new opportunities and new ways to have an impact on society. He travels like no one I know and has maintained this incomprehensible schedule for 50 plus years, all while somehow being a part of a wonderful family. He is the chairman or lead shareholder of companies in aerospace, agriculture, publishing, education, book distribution, film production, and real estate in now 22 countries around the world. Wow. He serves on the advisory board for the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in the Chancellor's Advisory Cabinet, both at UC San Diego. He also serves on the board of overseers at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, and I learned today on the executive committee now. Congratulations. He serves as a member of the board of directors of the Reason Foundation, a policy think tank focused on free market solutions to societal problems. Our guest is also a member of the board of directors for the Mekong Capital Group in Vietnam, one of that country's largest private equity funds. In recent years, today's guest has embarked on some major social entrepreneurship projects. He was a founder in building the Uganda Nursing School in Bawindi to address the shortage of skilled nurses in rural Africa. And his family built a preschool and kindergarten in Rwanda with a local entrepreneur called the Discovery International School, Rwanda. Wow. He's the author of two tremendous books. I've read both of them. One's called Capitalist at Large. It's a semi-biopic chronicling of his vast life's journeys that we're gonna explore a little today. And the other's called Across the Bars, Letters Between Two Friends, about his multi-decade friendship with a college pal who ended up in prison. Today's guest graduated from Stanford University with both a BA and an MBA, and he's married and has two children and resides in Rancho Santa Fe, California. Jim Jamison, welcome to Up To. Thank you very much, Adam. Nice to be here. What have you been up to? (laughs) Well, I just returned from France where I had my 30th annual retreat at a Benedictine monastery, thinking about life itself. Over 30 years, being in that monastery has been a great experience to reflect, to think, and to try to understand life itself. Wow. So what did you come away with this time, particularly? Well, each time you come away with, with thoughts about what is the meaning of life. I mean, what is the purpose of life? So to be in a monastery where you can't talk, where you're talking only in your head, hmm. and thinking about the deeper issues of life, even in age about what's meaningful, what's not meaningful, 
is important. So this time in particular, I walk away thinking about the issues of courage going forward in life, mm. the war in Russia and the Ukraine. The Ukrainians have demonstrated incredible courage. And what does courage mean in life? And what capacity do I have to try to help mm. the world in my remaining years? So what's my capacity? What's my talent? So what, what's my engagement in a world going forward? Tell me a little bit more about the monastery, because there's a lot of busy, business people who don't slow down. Like, how did you start doing this 30 years ago? What led you to think, I'm going to go to the monastery for a few days? You know, I think that, that for me, w w the world is comprised of 8 billion different people with 8 billion different personalities. There's no unique matchup. And for me, thinking about the serious, more difficult issues of life, the meaning of life, has been very important. So 30 years ago, it was going through some personal issues that I had trying to resolve those issues, which were unbelievably resolved well. And then I committed myself 30 years ago to say, this has been such an extraordinary experience, I'm going to go back each year mm. for the rest of my life. And each year I go back, and it, it takes moments to detox from the outside world, to purge yourself of the toxicity of what the world's all about, mm -hmm. and then to start thinking deeply about the constructs of what makes a meaningful life. Are you with other guests or is it just there, you there, there? Is, what's the there's, setting there's no talking there's retreatants you walk up in the wake up in the morning and you have a piece of bread and a bowl of coffee uh, by yourself and then you go in for lunch with the 80 benedictine monks that are in the monastery mm. and you have lunch with them in a cavernous underground stone wow. lunch room and then you go out and come back for dinner at uh, eight o'clock in a, that same cavernous room. There's eight services a day starting at 5.30 in the morning, all in Gregorian chant. And then there's reflection. And yes, there are other retreatants. When I was there a few days ago, there was 12 other retreatants who come for the same experience. But you aren't talking to each other. There's no talking. Wow. You can actually talk to a monk for 45 minutes during each visit. And so over 30 years, I've talked to the same monk, Father Michael Bazell whose father was, uh, uncle was Bill Buckley, a firing line. Mm -hmm. And I've only had 22 hours of conversation over 30 years. And he's become one of my closest friends in the world. Mm. One conversation is, Father Michael, I think I could defend God better than you can. Well, that's presumptuous of Jim Jameson to right. say to a monk who's given his life to obedience, poverty, and chastity. And my point to Father Michael was, he has to start to defend it through the Catholic Church, which has issues, historical issues. I can come in from the outside and defend God for God's sake alone, not mm. through a church, an organized religion. Mm. Um, I'm sure it creates a stimulating environment for when you leave and you can stay in touch with these folks outside of the retreat to explore all these big topics. Yeah. And, and I've actually asked Father Michael at my funeral would he come from Salem, France, to talk about a part of life that none of my family and friends really understand about Jim Jameson? Mm. That moment, those moments in a monastery over 30 years, because very few people would do that. Mm. He agreed? He agreed. So in 40 years, I'll meet him. Well, we'll see. <laughs> That's awesome. With luck. <laughs> I asked one of our close mutual friends, what question should I ask you? And Mark Tager, who has been on the podcast as well, said he's always been impressed with your intense curiosity. That's how he described it, intense curiosity. We're going to get into all of your career pursuits and how you ended up where you are today, but have you ever thought about the fact that you might have a particularly intense curiosity? Because I see that. By the way, Mark is correct. And, and where do you think that curiosity comes from? I don't know how much is genetic and how much is learned, how much is environmental. But the world's an interesting place. There's, as I said, eight billion different souls, each one with a great story. Mm -hmm. And every story from top to bottom is intriguing. And so why not search and try to understand the perspective of other people? Because everybody has a wonderful story. So I love intellectual curiosity, academic curiosity. I love personality curiosity, geopolitical, religious curiosity, always exploring, always thinking, and trying to go to deeper levels. Well, you're right. Everybody does have an interesting story. So why don't we just spend a few minutes getting the group watching up to speed on your story? Uh, can you give us just a few moments of how you got to where you are and maybe yeah. from the you high know, school age and it, going to school in Europe? 
As I said, Soren Kierkegaard, who lived from 1811 to 1855, said life can only be understood backward, but it's lived forward. So you, at your age, Adam, still have a lot of life to go through. Hopefully. The tapestry and the jigsaw puzzle still has pieces to be placed. My life, being a generation older than you, has pretty much been completed. My jigsaw puzzle, my tapestry has been woven. And I can look back and think, how did it all happen? Well, a father who threw a boy into the world at the age of 11. My father was an airplane salesman. 1960, nobody was doing this, but he said, do you want to go to school in Switzerland, learn French? Learn at age 11. At age 11. Mm -hmm. Your decision, Jim, not mine, your decision. Two days later, a young 11-year-old comes down crying and says, Dad, I want to do it, knowing I couldn't see my family for a year and I couldn't make a phone call home at that moment, 1960, without mm -hmm. going through an international operator. At the age of 16, my father was still an airplane salesman. Do you want to have an internship between uh, sophomore and junior year in high school in Australia, working for Qantas Airlines, writing tickets by hand, doing fare calculations by hand? Dad, I'd love it. The second half of that summer, I wandered the world on my own. This is 1965. Mm. To places like Singapore at that moment was a backwater colonial city. Hong Kong was a backwater colonial city in India. Delhi was a revelation, <clears throat> but more importantly, going into Kandahar, Afghanistan, and Kabul, Afghanistan, and to Tehran, and to Baghdad, and to Beirut. A 16-year-old. My mom didn't know where I was. My dad didn't know. I was wandering the world in 1965 with no connection. No cell phones. Seeing, seeing yeah. and understanding what the world was all about. So a father who threw me into the world gave me a passion for the world. Then second influence is a wife who tolerated a Marco Polo going around the world <laughs> and planting flags in countries and building businesses in countries. Because most women would have said, wives would have said, no, absolutely no. But I had a wife who was unbelievable. And the third major influence was a network of friends through a Young President's Organization and my study of philosophy, the great books, Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, Maimonides, who caused me to think deeper about what I see at the monastery, the deeper issues of life. So those three influences created, as I look back now, my life. Mm. Do you think that you always knew you would be a businessman or think still to those early years, maybe in the high school years in Switzerland, or were there different paths you could have taken, maybe a why in the road where you went this way instead of that way, or pressure from your family? No, I don't think there was ever pressure, but there was a slow inexorable building of confidence. Mm. So to have a, a 11, 12 year old going to school by himself away from his family for a year in Switzerland, mm -hmm. to have a boy wandering at 16 the roads of Kandahar, Afghanistan, and Kabul, and Baghdad, and Tehran, that I was never afraid of the world, that slowly the confidence was built. And then I think partially genetically that I had the fire and the passion to be an entrepreneur. Not being afraid of the world, I engaged it. Engaged it in businesses, engaged it in opportunity, in social relationships. So I think it built over a period of time, the confidence, the feeling, and understanding through that confidence that I had passion and I had fire in my belly to go do things that most people would never think about. Yeah, that's like the typical nature versus nurture question. Is somebody just naturally gifted or are these outside stimuli affecting who you become, and it's a complicated uh, answer. But I think you told me one time in college, is that when you tried to talk your way into starting a Hughes helicopter franchise in no, Asia? I was actually a, a, a young man just graduating from university okay. and had an opportunity uh, to engage with five other partners in having the distributorship for Hughes helicopters in the country of Indonesia, like having a car distributorship right. or dealership. And I went down there, married my high school sweetheart, who after 51 years were still together with smiles on our faces, mm -hmm. and then uh, had a home run. We sold 125 helicopters, had a 15% commission on the helicopters, a 25% commission on spare parts, 25% commission on training pilots and mechanics in Indonesia to fly the helicopters. And You were uh, like 21, 22? I was 22, tw I was 22 and then went into 23. No one spoke the local language. No, Daphne and I, my wife and I, both learned Indonesian, and so it was a wonderful experience. We were the youngest people. Local people in Jakarta, Indonesia, in 1971 and 72 said, who are these young people? Right. The KGB agents at the Russian embassy wanted to say, we better get to know these people. Who, who They're selling helicopters? He's 22 and she's 23, and they're in Jakarta? The CIA officers at the U.S. embassy wanted to know who we were. So our social, because we were young 
and innocent and in a third world country. Uh, it was an unbelievable experience, sure. and financially, it was a wonderful success in making some money. But early. that wasn't a given. I mean, you took a but, risk. I mean, you but, clearly have a, a high risk tolerance, yeah. which not everyone has. But, but well, I mean, how could, given the background of a father who threw me into the world, I turn down an opportunity to move to Indonesia and be involved in a startup business like a car dealership except selling helicopters? And it was unbelievable. Uh, the whole experience, thinking back, was unbelievable, and I made some money. Mm. Good. Well, I think when I got to know you, your aerospace company, this is about 20 years ago, was kind of like the main company that I identified you with, even though you weren't the operating CEO, you're the chairman of Glen Air. Was that like your first like really sizable business? No, by the way, I had a legacy from my father of a 154th interest in a small company in Glendale, California, making a very small part for electrical connectors and it was doing a million dollars in sales. And I knew it had long-term potential, and so I engaged in building the international side of its product line. And it built and built and built, and today we manufacture in South Korea, in Italy, in England, in Chicago, in Los Angeles. We have 4,500 employees. Mm -hmm. And we in the electrical interconnect business, moving voice data in single from point A to point B, electrical current, voice, and power on soldiers, on ships, on Mars Perseverance, on the Mars rover. So from a small nothing, it turned into a significant privately held company in which I have a significant ownership. Yeah, you're, and, you're more than 1 54th of it now. Yeah, and by the way, the company was started with $3,600 by six partners. My mm. dad was one sixth partner. He put up 600 and he gave us six, $600, and mm. he gave us $600 to nine kids, his four children and nieces and nephews. So I got a 1 54th interest in $600. By the time I got it, it was worth $11,000, which was a lot of money back in 1971 or 72. But growing the company, and again, the company has an incredible team. You've met Peter Kaufman, the CEO. Great last name. Who is, who is um, a genius in, yeah. in building and understanding a counterintuitive model and creating a business that beats the competition. Mm -hmm. So we got new products, we built the company, and we're the best of the best in our subset of the aerospace industry today. So I can understand helicopters, aerospace, but then as I'm getting to know you further, a couple years into it, I hear about you becoming the largest purveyor of books in China. I think you were talking about kind of copying the Amazon model a little yeah. bit. So you went from aerospace to China. Uh, and they were all in parallel, so there's nothing I yielded. I stayed in everything. And so in, in China, the predecessor story was when communism fell in Poland in 19, January of 1989, I went in, I was the international president of the Young President's Organization to start a local YPO chapter, Young President's Chapter in Poland. It was too early. But I was enamored with a country coming out of communism, and I said, I have to do business here. Poland we're talking about. Poland we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. So we ended up privatizing the largest state-owned publisher at the time, encyclopedia and academic publisher, which we still have 30 years later. So pause but that caused me that caused me to think about publishing worldwide. And so all of a sudden I met a young man in China who had a publishing company and the publishing industry was controlled by the communist government. And he said, do you want to, do you want to work with me on my publishing company? And, and there's 546 state-owned companies in China in publishing. But we have a small company that the government's looking at, allowing us to publish our own books as long as we stay away from politics and religion and other things. And we thought, want to start a book distribution company for the 546 Chinese state mm -hmm. publishers. Mm -hmm. We were looking at Amazon, which was just launching in the mid-90s. And we copied that model, and we built the first internet bookstore in China called dongdong.com. It ended up put a small amount of money in it, but it ended up going public on the New York Stock Exchange in 2010, and it went public for a lot of money. It rang the bell. $1.2 right. billion dollar market capitalization in 2010. Wow. L let's back up, and I was trying to interrupt you. I'm sorry. You discovered your fondness for publishing in Poland. That led to the China opportunity. I didn't make that connection before. So, but why did you get into publishing in Poland? I know you said you wanted to just capitalize on Poland opening up, but why publishing? Did you look at different industries before publishing? You know, you know, everything has been really opportunistic, seeing an opportunity. So I actually went from selling helicopters in Indonesia to building farms for eight years in Saudi Arabia. I lived, I lived a year in Iran in 1975, and I lived eight years in and out of Saudi Arabia, taking the desert and making it green. 
at that moment, the Saudis were subsidizing wheat to 10 times the world market price. Mm. Actually, five times the world market price. World market price was $200 a ton, and they were giving $1,000 a ton to anybody who wanted to grow wheat. And I'd take the land, like a construction company, the desert, put wells down 10,000 feet to find water and level the land. Mm. And it was all opportunistic that I got into selling helicopters in Indonesia, building farms in Saudi Arabia for eight years, obviously nepotistic with a 154th in an aerospace company, and an opportunity in Poland to privatize a state-owned publishing company, mm -hmm. which then led to an opportunity in China. So everything is very opportunistic, not with a strategic plan. It happened. And my gut told me, go. Let's talk about the gut a little bit. That's what I was... You must be exposed to many opportunities that you have to decide, should we jump into this or not? Like, how do you think about, is it the founder that really helps you decide if you believe in the founder and some set of character traits, or is it the industry? You've named six or seven different industries already. How do you decide what to jump into? By the way, it is the founder. An entrepreneur genetically quickly knows another entrepreneur. Right. You can see it in their eyes, you can see it in their passion, you can see it in the fire in the belly. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's does the person across the table have what I think it takes with his idea, not mm -hmm. my idea, to mm -hmm. build a business? And the, what they, they typically lack is capital. And then I always make a bet that if it doesn't work, I can afford to lose the amount of capital that's being bet. And so far, they've all basically worked, you know, and the entrepreneurs have done well. Which some better than yeah. others, by the way. Have any not worked? You know, I can't think of one that doesn't work. It's, it's like the, the uh, and this is a peculiar parallel, the Russian-Ukraine war. Is it not going to work for Ukraine? Well, they have the perseverance. They have the courage. So we won't know. But my sense is that things work out better for Ukraine than President Putin thought because of their courage and their perseverance and their abilities. So for me, it's staying with things through the ups and the downs. It's like a human relationship. Do you get out at a down, or do you stay through the ups and the downs, assuming you think you have a good product in a good marketplace that has a good future? Well, I actually like your parallel with the Ukraine <clears throat> example because in both cases of the company and Ukraine, there's a dynamic leader with a stick to and a yeah. grit that goes beyond what maybe the conventional wisdom would say is going to be happening. And I think right. that's a really good, that's, not, that's, a, that's a good example I would have never thought of. But there's got to be maybe uh, an entrepreneur that you were wrong about or um, an investment that didn't really kind of fit the market conditions or, or, or are you really batting a thousand with all of your decisions? Well, but I, I can't say I'm batting a thousand, but I, in reflecting back, as Kierkegaard said, I haven't had any major disasters. And again, my bets in backing people are always measured bets, meaning money that I could afford right. to lose. Right. Now, by the way, I have 50, 25 employees in the Ukraine. Is, that a, is that a loser? Currently. Is that a loser or not a loser? Well, a lot of people would never have had the courage. Are they still operating the as a business? Yeah. What, what are they? Sales have dropped to zero, and I send money in, paying the payroll each month. Right. Everyone's safe. But, but my point is, how do I know whether Ukraine's going to work out or not work out? It started, it started to build and to grow, and then all of a sudden there was a war. Mm. Now, do I have the courage to stay with it, to support this team of 25 in legal publishing in the Ukraine? Yeah, I do, mm. you know, and we'll see how it works out. My bet is that it turns out not just well, but very well, because the foreign aid, which will be going into Ukraine post the resolution of the conflict, will be gigantic. The EU has just offered Ukraine to join the European Union. So that, and I'm in legal publishing where everybody has to understand the laws there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. I have a uh, agricultural business too in the Imperial Valley east of San Diego, and olives, in, in olives, but also in organic vegetables. Well, they, you know, the, the farms have done okay. They haven't done great, but all of a sudden they just dis and I've had this one farm for 40 years. They discovered the biggest deposit of lithium in the United States of America. Wow, that'll be valuable. But they're very valuable. And again, our farm could be moved into a real estate development for housing. We've got it entitled for throw that. So time, perseverance, guts, vision, belief, courage are all very important. So Ukraine's not doing well right now. We have an ag tech company in Kenya that's just bumping along. Mm -hmm. But we're going to keep betting it for the long run with courage. We like the local entrepreneur, Moses. 
He's in ag tech in Kenya, which has a good future. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't been a home run. It's bumping along, but we're going to stay with it. Do you find yourself mentoring these entrepreneurs all that you back? Them. All of them. All of them. How about you? Who, who, who mentored you, or how did you develop well, into the you leader know, I, you I, Mentorship became? is gigantically important for everyone in life. For those who've never had a mentor, in my opinion, they start at a disadvantage. I had four. One was a father who's not really a mentor, but who created a culture around me, throwing me into the world early. Mm -hmm. But two was a retired four-star army general who I went to Indonesia with, who was the boss of the company, a company of five people with the distributorship for the Hughes helicopter. He taught me the definition of strategy. Hmm. And his definition to me was always cover the downside first. Whatever you're getting into in life, if it doesn't go according to your desires or your dreams, can you cover the failure mm -hmm. before you look at the upside? Then, in parallel and secondary, look at the upside. Well, what an incredible, valuable lesson that was for me at the age of 22 from a retired four-star Army general. How do you get a, connected with I a four-star general? I had a, 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 let me diverge for a second back to the other, uh, a retired publisher in the UK, United Kingdom, who was my mentor in publishing. I didn't know anything about publishing. Mm. It was unbelievable. Then I had the, the, the third or fourth, depending on how you count my father, was a dirt farmer in the Imperial Valley of, of mm. Imperial Valley east of San Diego. Mm. But wh how much can you learn from a dirt farmer, somebody who's got his boots on the ground? So he, was, he got me into Saudi Arabian agriculture and got me into the farming in the Imperial Valley. So the mentors, each offering something completely different, mm -hmm. helped to nurture and helped to build my life. Do you think you looked for those type of skill sets in your mentors, or was that also opportunistic? No, I mean, like, how do you find a mentor? Like I you draw, started, you started the you started the question by saying curiosity. Right. I had a voracious curiosity for each of these mentors. All of a sudden, they looked at this young man, Jim Jameson, and he was kind of special because he asked deep, significant questions, and so they adopted me. Right. They cared for me, and of course, reciprocity. I cared back for them, and they built and stayed with me over a period of time, which was wonderful. They were instrumental in anything I can claim in life. So when you're 23, how do you get paired up with a four-star general? How does that happen? Oh, it's a, it was an introduction through a father. Um, Your father? So my father, yeah. So my father, again, he threw me into the world early, but he paid attention to me through the early stages of my life. And it was just an introduction. You should meet my son to a retiring four-star army general. But then it's up to you and, to stay connected with this general. Yeah, and, and then he had this opportunity in Indonesia with, with three Chinese partners, mm. Indonesian Chinese partners. Would you like to come in and be our junior man on the ground in Jakarta? Yep, mm. I would. Without a doubt, I said, yep, I would. But first I have to marry my high school sweetheart, which I did in August of 71, 1971, and we both moved this day after a marriage to Jakarta. Here's to Daphne. And, and again, it was an unbelievable experience. Mm. You've mentioned your father several times. Uh, maybe let's look forward, your kids. Do you feel like the way your father helped you develop informed what you've done for your kids, or has it been yeah. a different parenting style? As, a, as, a, as an example and a contra example, my father was married and divorced, and married and divorced, and married and divorced. Mm. So it taught me that, and he was an incredible father through all that, mm. tearing his four children kind of asunder with the emotional distress of, of being married and divorced, married and divorced, married and divorced. But then on the other side of life, he was a bigger than life personality. Mm. And he opened doors. So do I open doors for my adult children and before? Absolutely. And did, by the way, and did they have the desire to walk into the doors? You can't open a door that a child's not interested in walking into. That's what I'm saying about you. You jumped on these doors yeah. that your dad So, so the, the two adult children I have now, have jumped into the opportunity. We, Daphne and I exposed them into the world when they were young. We traveled the world. Jess and my son worked in China, worked in Spain, got his MBA in Switzerland at IMD. My daughter, you know, got her master's in Egypt and went to Jordan to relocate Syrian refugees, went to Rwanda to start a school, went into the State Department. But it all started by Daphne and I taking them, doing what my dad did to me, mm. taking young people, our children, into the world so they could see a bigger context than the United States of America. And they gravitated to it. They loved it. And so that's what binds us today, keeping the family together in love and affection, but also in giving them opportunity that they understood and that they liked. And again, their choice. It wasn't a father dictating. 
do this or do that. Your choice, Justin, Alexandra. Well, it's good that the family ethos has continued into the next generation. That's not a given. I know many oh, of successful okay, sure. families where the next generation, what's it called, from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations, oh. meaning you're not going to be white collar that long. So kudos to the family. Something special is going on there, and I know you would agree it's not just you, it's your wife. Uh, I also like hearing, though, that you remain close with your father in spite of, um, you know, the multiple stepmoms and, you know, that didn't fracture you guys too much. That's not always the case either. No. Did that take some effort by you to yeah. by the way, stay connected? Every human being has flaws. For some sure. Ha some have greater flaws than others. Yeah. My father had incredible virtues. Incredible virtues. Yeah, I'm not judging him. I'm, I'm so, just commending no, no, you. But you don't happen to just tell them I'm responding to your, yeah. your point. Yeah. That, that, that can you overlook a, a parent who divorces, remarries and divorces? Yeah. yeah. But it's his life. But I picked the best out of him. And I took the contra examples of that that didn't make sense to me and tried to work not using those contra examples as templates for my own life. By the way, the, the, how do you get to a good life? You, you do have to study life itself. You ask about the monastery. You know, most people get life for, everybody gets life for free. You, you, Adam Kaufman didn't do anything to be on this planet. He got it for free. But also, we all get the answer books to how to maximize the probability of a good outcome in life mm -hmm. for free. Mm -hmm. And that stack of books, and there's a medley of different books you could use, is only that high. I'd say 99.9% .9 of my friends choose not to read the books. Right. So they get life for free. They get the answer books, not to how to have a great, to maximize the probability of a good outcome. And they choose not to read the not books. Not to read the game plan. I yeah. read the books. And it has been very, very helpful over a period of my years. Sometimes in your answers to my questions, it sounds like you're saying, well, of course. But hear me out here. P people have certain character traits that they're, good at and for you you're saying of course i'd stay close with my father i'm i'm you you said i'm picking the best of him and that's tremendous but like my parents were divorced and it hurt my relationship with my father it, it's an of course for you but i'm probably thinking right now that i didn't pick the best of my father and so it's a it's a good learning for me and i just want to commend you because it's not a given that everyone would pick the best of their parent in a situation like this. So it's just, it's just really impressive. Let me, let me make a point there. The book you referenced, Across the Bars, is my, high, is my college roommate who ended up murdering a mm. woman. Mm. I see him twice a year in prison for the last 22 years. Most of his friends, naturally, walked away from the relationship. But I chose not to walk away, not to forgive him his sin, of taking a life, it's unforgivable. Mm. But to say there's other things in his life that have meaning. And wow. so we wrote this book, our letters, back and forth for 20 years, he in prison, Stanford graduate, me in prison, uh, outside of prison, Stanford graduate. And it's incredible. And the value that relationship has given to me, despite his sin, has been priceless. The value of my father's relationship to me mm -hmm. was priceless. Mm -hmm. And to me, the loyalty evidenced in that book is priceless. Your loyalty to your friend in prison, is, is it a life sentence? He'll always be there? No, it's 22 years, which is coming up. He might go on parole. He has okay. to go before a parole board. But, but you uh, started this a long time ago. With right him. after he murdered his lover. Mm. Wow. Well, you mentioned the stack of books that help us maybe increase the chances of us achieving some success in life. What's another book uh, that, in addition to the Pillars book, maybe you'd have me read? Well, by the way, um, first of all, the, all the great tenets of religion, the Book of Buddha, Confucius, uh, the Bible, the Torah, Talmud, the Mishnah, the uh, Koran. You've read all of those. By the way, and they're all valuable, and there's overlapping themes in mm -hmm. all of them. And then you go look at the great philosophers of all time, starting with Socrates and Plato, um, you know, and you go through them and it's all there. You don't have to read them all because it's all riddled with parallel philosophies of how to have a good outcome in life. The religious texts are all the same, mm -hmm. you know. Some are Very monotheistic, similar. you know, and, and some aren't. Confucianism. Basic tenet is respect, respect, respect. Respect your parents, respect your society. Do unto others. 
Yeah. And, and well, as well as that, but it's just respect. In America today, we've lost respect for one another, for the institutions, for family, mm. and it's very difficult to see. The Chinese are steeped in Confucianism. The Book of Buddha, the Four Noble Truths. I mean, you know, this is time-tested wisdom. You ignore it, and you choose to ignore that which works in life. Time-tested. I'm grateful that Calfi, Halter, and Griswold has once again agreed to partner with us. With offices in Ohio and Washington, D.C., this full-service national law firm focuses on all aspects of business and the law, including corporate and finance, intellectual property, and government relations. Let me be clear. I actually approach companies with whom I would like to partner. We just don't accept marketing dollars from anyone. I have been referring my CEO and entrepreneur friends to Calfee for years. I really believe in the firm. One of their notable practice areas is in mergers and acquisitions. And recently, for instance, I introduced a successful entrepreneur in the Midwest to Calfee when he told me that a European-based conglomerate wanted to buy his business. Calfee works with large corporations as well as privately held companies throughout the U.S. and Canada and in Europe and Asia, too. So whether it's selling your own business or the more routine needs of creating your first will or anything in between, this firm can really do it all in terms of legal needs. Once again, the firm is Calfee, Halter, and Griswold, and you can find them at calfee.com or on the UpTo Foundation website. I've always liked how you've looked at different faith systems and kind of taken the best of them and maybe they're the common traits and, and brought them into your life. I know. The monastery you've mentioned uh, is a Catholic uh, monastery. Uh, I think you were born Catholic, but I think you have a, a Buddhist garden at your house, right? So you have a little bit of that in your lifestyle. Uh, what do you about? What do you think about like people who have no faith? I, I'm always surprised how people can go through life without any faith system. I almost feel bad when somebody's going through a major challenge. When I hear my friend talk about maybe a loved one who's sick, I often ask, what's what's his or her faith system? Do you ever think about that? And I'm not saying we all need to be evangelists, but whatever the faith system is, it, it's a key part of the human life experience yeah. here. But there, I, I said on the planet, there's 8 billion people, 2.2 billion Christians, 1.8, 1.9 million Islamic faith. There's 800 million Buddhist. There's three or 400 million Confucianism. But there's also a billion to atheists, right. agnostics. Right. And by the way, how do you make how do you make the proof that this all wasn't an accident? I mean, the atheists say there was no design, grand design plan by some superior being. The atheists yeah. and agnostics say this is all an accident. It just happened. It just hap It just evolved. Well, you can't prove it one way or another, and that's where faith comes in, which is critically important. Right. But they can't prove that there's not a grand designer, and you can't prove that there is. It's a matter of faith. And it's much more consoling, in my opinion, to have the faith. Yeah, I guess the intelligent design attempt is a way to speak of, if not God, some other way of helping all of this become what it has become. Not everyone agrees with intelligent design, but yeah, it's, it's obviously a, a, he a heavy topic. So I'm at the monastery, as I said a couple of days ago, and I'm walking through the garden, and I'm looking at a rose a perfect rose. Man didn't create that. Right. I mean, how do you see the perfection in the plants and the trees and the animals? The perfection, especially at looking and smelling the fragrance of a rose and its beauty and knowing that man didn't create it. Mm. Just an accident? It's wonderful. Just a pure accident? Right. Well, maybe not. Good reminder. Uh, today at lunch, we were talking a little bit before uh, our conversation here, and I could not believe that you knew about Lebanon's election results from just last month and the ramifications on uh, the current president there and who's backed by Hezbollah. How on earth, among all of your businesses and all of your countries, and you're so engaged with your family, how, how do you find time to stay so up to date with everything? I often ask people, what do you read? What, what do you, in addition to the books, what do you read to know that Lebanon's election results in last month's um, you know, parliamentary elections were what they were. How, how do you keep up with all that? Uh, you know, every society has its biases and prejudices. Even America, even Europe. I want to understand all the biases and prejudices. So I read 
Al Jazeera from the Middle East every day. Hmm. I read the Jerusalem Post from Israel every day. What insight into the Middle East that you're not going to get it in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal? I read China J Daily that the Chinese Communist paper put out every day, the English language. I read hmm. that a Morning Post out of Hong Kong. I read hmm. Russia Today. <laughs> You know, I want to understand what is being given to everybody in the world and how they form their biases and prejudices. And why do I do that? One, because my father gifted me the world at a young age and I want to understand the world. But two, I want to try to become as objective as possible. I want to understand everybody else's viewpoint. Mm -hmm. So when I say I read those, I spend two hours a day going through those. But what insight into reading the Chinese Communist paper every single day, or Russia Today every single day, or Al Jazeera, or mm -hmm. Jerusalem Post, that most people will never get to understand their perspective. So I can try to lift myself above the subjectivity and biases with good critical thinking to form my own opinions. The echo chambers are so dangerous, and we only talk to people who agree with us or on social media only read posts of agreeable topics. So I love that you have these different, even with propaganda sources. Um, when I was being trained on debating and public speaking in my early political life, we t were taught that Edmund Burke's uh, theory that understanding your opponent's best argument is actually a, a good thing because then it can help you evaluate your own position or maybe even being open to the other, other side's viewpoint. And, and you're definitely doing that with these newspapers. Well, let me make one more point about that. Go. Over, who will be in the history books, probably of all the world's history books, a thousand years from now, who lived during your lifetime, Adam Kaufman? An astronaut. Yeah. Neil, Neil Armstrong. Yeah. Well, he was a friend for 30 years. I'm cheating. I, I, saw him, yeah. I saw him twice a year for 30 years. And Gene Cernan, who was the last man on the moon in December of 1972, was a friend. When you get off the planet, you get a different perspective. You look back at the globe in space and the darkness with the blue oceans and the clouds and the b backdrop of black mm -hmm. in space, and you understand we're one humanity. How tiny we are, yeah. No, it's just that we're one humanity. Yeah. We are tiny in the universe, but we're one humanity sharing one small planet, and somehow we don't get along mm. because of systems, religions, because of ideologies, and it's not, it's not very enlightened that after 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years, we can't get along when we are one humanity, and we need to get along. Speaking of Neil Armstrong, are you on any list to go up in outer no. space now no. that this commercial? No. No. Being a generation older than you, I'm enjoying my time here. You could although, do it, though. You're fit. Although uh, our aerospace company has parts on all of the Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and NASA and Lockheed. So I'm all in on space. You can but, get a subcontractor, uh, a subcontractor discount probably. You know, I think that's like 50 million uh, you can I, do I, it for It's a lack else. of desire too, but <laughs> you should be the guy signing up. Uh, I joked about your fitness and you could do it. What do you do to stay in shape? You're, you're, you have not changed in 20 years oh, you're, and your you're, hair is very enviable, by the <laughs> way. <laughs> you're kind. Well, I, you know, you taught me years ago, if our relationship is 25 years old or 20 years old, that being proactive in health is critical. I mean, wh why not try to get the extra years on the back end? And too many people right. don't pay attention. So I get up at four in the morning and I exercise for an hour and a half, including a half hour swim and elliptical and then body exercises. And I come home from work and I do a half hour of additional swimming. So I work out two hours a day, seven days a week, um, because I love it and it's addictive and I feel good about it and I do know that there's a direct correlation between exercise and longevity. And you've always been on the front end of technology as well in terms of health and prevention, uh, body scans or different um, annual ways to kind of forecast and predict potential problems. So anything really captivating right now in terms of new medical pursuits? Well. Now, other than being proactive, and I mentioned to you about Health Nucleus, where we do a, a genetic scan to figure out if you have a tendency towards certain cancers, mm -hmm. and know that in advance, yep. and to uh, MRI every year to look at your body organs and benchmark them against thousands of other body organs to look for anomalies. But being proactive, and by the way, Adam Kaufman taught me this years mm -hmm. ago. and. Thanks. Bill Rowley, yeah, right. which was just uh, critically important. Be right. proactive, and you'll, if you have a good life, why not get the maximum longevity? 
I always say health is the ultimate common denominator. No matter how successful you are, if you get that negative phone call, you're, you know, you could be just as sick as the, yeah. the guy who doesn't have 22 companies. And but, it can but, really... it, but it's amazing how many people don't pay attention to your right. health. You walk around the streets today compared to a generation ago, and it seems to me that people aren't as cognizant of that as mm -hmm. they should be, of mm -hmm. their health. They're mm -hmm. overweight, they don't exercise, they eat terrible foods, You're right. and it's very sad. Definitely in America. I was at Johns Hopkins two weeks ago, and I met with the president there, a really sharp woman who's an internal medicine doctor, and also with the head of their aging center. Uh, and it was interesting that in both cases, they talked about um, how we're all living longer in America, but we're not caring enough about the caregivers, often the spouse of the sick, more sick, uh, husband or wife or the child who's taking care of an aging parent. We're right now in this tidal wave of aging population that I don't know if in any of your businesses you follow any of this, but we're, we don't have enough hospitals or hospital beds or at-home nurses. The American population is really aging and uh, there's going to have to be some different ways we take care of them. In, in other countries, like in Lebanon where our family's from, uh, it's more often that you bring you know, the, the older parent into the house. But that's not as true in America. But do you think much about like the aging population in America? Maybe maybe you're training your kids. I don't. I don't, I don't take care devote of you. a lot of time to it. Other than I know that our medical system is not serving its people very well in right. America. Yeah, you're right. Compared to benchmarks against Singapore or Switzerland or Germany or right. other countries. Mm. Well, I have just a, a few more questions, but it's uh, it's amazing how quick the time goes, Jim. I reflect back on some of the walks we've taken over the years and the career development you've helped me with, and I'm, I'm grateful for that, I've told you many times. Do you ever think about if you were going on a walk with maybe your younger self on the beach in Del Mar, if you were talking to the 17-year-old Jim Jameson, would have you coached knowing now what you know, your younger you any differently? No. I, you know. Life demands discipline, self-discipline, and too few people to talk about the health of right. American people Eating have well. self-discipline. Right. You know, uh, so self-discipline, and then studying, as I said earlier, life. Why do you have to repeat errors made by other people when you could learn how not to, to repeat those errors by reading and thinking, whether that's business management, reading books of people who've gone before, who or parenting, had, just or basic, or about everything yeah, in life. Right. There's no education in the second kick of a mule. Don't get kicked twice. That's and good. all of the wisdom of life is in books. Learn from them. You clearly have been so successful in so many pursuits. How do you remain humble? How do you manage your pride? This, this show is leaders as humble as they are successful. I wouldn't have invited you here if you weren't a humble man. So how do you, who, who keeps you in check or do you do that yourself? By the way, I, I, I'm no better or worse than any of the other 8 billion people on the planet. My mm. story is an interesting story, but everybody else's is too. And so for me, who am I to think that I'm better than anyone? You know, I have a different story. I've also had a lot of luck. By the way, when I look back on life and I think how much of my outcome is pure luck, mm. it's over 50%. Mm. A good family, born in America, not in Ghana, Africa, or in Nigeria, Africa a family that could provide an education, you know, a family that, that gave me opportunity, a father who opened doors. So much was luck. So I have to be humble. And now the mission of the balance of my life is, how do I pay back the luck that I didn't earn? Mm. It just happened. Well, I pay back the luck by going around the world and starting businesses and helping other people, fostering their dreams and ambitions, creating jobs and tax bases in Rwanda and Kenya and, uh, and Uganda. So how could we all not be humble? Yet we all aren't humble. So this is an example of it's easy for you because that's how you're wired. But we both know many of successful people who are not humble. And uh, so I and just wonder. Are they, the ultimate question in life is, did you have a happy life? Mm -hmm. With the mistakes you might have made, did you have a happy life across many dimensions? And a lot of those people you talk about who aren't humble, didn't necessarily have a happy life, didn't have a happy outcome. Because we know, textured in the Bible and the Quran and the book, of, that humility is a tremendous virtue. For sure. It's a tremendous virtue. So humility, 
time tested by wisdom and religion is an incredible benefit in life. Yeah, Why would you walk away from it? I agree. Humility related to forgiveness. It's related to doing unto others. I mean, that's why it's the theme of our show. I have one humility story involving you I want to share. Uh, I was walking with you to a class at Georgetown. You were uh, guest lecturing at Georgetown Business School a few years ago before coronavirus. And we were walking in, and it happened to be in this building called the Hariri Building. And I'm feeling all cool because of my Lebanese heritage. And I say, you know, Jim, um, this building is named after Rafi Kariri, who was sadly assassinated. And you just listened to me intently. You didn't say one word. And I shared a little bit more about Lebanon or how long ago he died and what's going on in Lebanon now. And you just listened to me. We go in, you do your presentation with the ambassadors there and uh, the students. And your opening slide is a picture of you and Rafiq Kariri, the prime minister I was, t I was educating you on. But you let me go. You didn't one-up me like so many people. Do you remember that conversation? Well, I remember it very well. It was, by the way, I was very you were proud so humble. That, to be able to, in humility, say, I just had dinner with <laughs> right. the prime minister of Lebanon, Hariri, the son of the man who was assassinated. Right. And it's a great moment. But why? Why have to brag? Why have to be out front I love that what about you've you. done, yeah. that, 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 that everybody's done something. Even the most hum humble person has a great story, as I say. Yeah, well, Mother Teresa, to me, is the ultimate example of that. Um, before we close, I wanted to ask one thing about the future. Uh, we've talked a lot about what you've learned in the past. What are you, what are you most excited about looking forward right now? You know, I, I'm building a marine lab in Baja, Mexico, to attach to Scripps Institution of Oceanography. I'm building out the school in Uganda, the nursing school there. I'm going to build a Catholic church in a small fishing village in Mexico where you've been. Mm. Um, then how do I contribute to the world? America is, in my opinion, and this is my opinion, decay. Mm. What do I do to try to help in the, my remaining years? And what do I do, given a father who threw me into the world, to try to help the world as a beat of the butterfly's wings at the margin? And so my goal is to to enjoy the family, to enjoy my friends, which are priceless, and then to continue to try to make the United States understand some of the defects and the world a better place. That's tremendous. You said a few of those projects quickly. I'm trying to recap them. A Catholic church in uh, Mexico, a new um, laboratory. A marine, marine laboratory, laboratory, also in Mexico. Right. And what were the other two projects? Well, uh, the build, I wish you could do more. You're not doing enough. <laughs> the build out of the nursing school. We still have things to add to the camp. We have the best nursing school in Uganda to find by 100% of each eight year graduating classes pass the national nursing exam in Uganda. And no other school has that record in a country with 50 other schools. Now how does that even come up? Like, how but do you start I, a nursing just, school? Again, it was, it was coincident. I went to see the silverback gorillas. There was a woman sitting at our camp. She didn't see the gorillas. Who are you? I worked out at the local hospital. My friend Steve Wolf, the ex-chairman CEO of United Airlines, we went down to see the hospital, tears in our eyes. What do you need? We need a nursing school. So we built him a nursing school. And we nurture. We've sent the head of school to get her PhD at Villanova. She got her master's degree at the University of Edinburgh. Mm. So we're very hands-on. But what do I do to give back? If I've had so much luck, my obligation is to give back to the world in the way I know how to do it. Mm. There's not many people that could go to Rwanda and build a preschool no. kindergarten no, or Uganda and build a nursing school or an ag tech company and a film company in Vietnam and or a lab in Mexico. I know how to do that, and I have courage to do it. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that are still my dreams. Well, I'm grateful you had the courage to come onto the Up To podcast today, your first ever podcast. Uh, you're benefiting me every time we talk, including okay. today. Jim, thanks so much for being here. Adam, thank you for having me. It's been okay. a joy. Great. Thank you for listening to the Up To podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe via your podcast platform of choice. To receive our newsletter, suggest speakers, and give your candid feedback, please email Adam directly at adam at uptofoundation.org. We would love to hear from you. The Up To podcast is produced by the BL Media Group, right outside of the nation's capital in Washington, D.C. See you next time.